has heard about hook, book, look, took? Yeah. Okay, pretty much everybody. Cool. Oh, except me. Yeah, maybe you guys haven't heard because you guys were too young at that time, maybe. David C. Hey, Cook? No. Yeah, okay. It's, David C. Cook is known for using hook, book, look, took. Um, for, those, for, the, for those who know about it, like, what do you know about it? <laughs> that should be serious. <laughs> what do you know about Hobo Kluk Tuk? Or what do you remember? Uh, well, question two, uh, Johnny. Good morning. There's Krispy Kreme if you want. Two boxes of it. So what do you guys know about Hobo Kluk Tuk? Those who rose their hands, or you don't remember anything? Not much? I can probably guess. Okay. So your hook is basically trying to grab the attention of your class. Okay. Book is the book that you're studying. Okay. <laughs> taking a deeper um, sort of study of, okay. your, of your passage or whatever material you have. Okay. okay. I don't know what took is. Okay. Application. Application. Okay. 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 We'll have some adjustment in what you just said. Okay. Hook. Um, oh, actually, before we, st before I even go further, um, this class is for, uh, or this workshop is for. You'll see the Sunday school teachers, there's Bible study leaders. Uh, in the end, I don't really care if you do Sunday school or Bible study, uh, but if you are dealing with the God, with the Bible and teaching it, then to me, you're a Bible, you're a Bible educator, uh, and that's all I care about for this morning. Um, there are there are definitely slight differences when it comes to Bible study in Sunday school, but when it comes to stuff like this, it works on both uh, areas of, of teaching the Bible. Um, and then because of that, to make things easier this morning, like uh, there'll be times when I say Bible study, um, when it actually is interchangeable, right? I might say teacher, but you know, like, I mean, there's no Sunday school, there are Sunday school teacher, but there's no, you don't really call Bible study leader, Bible study teacher. So, I mean, just to make it clear that, you know, I'll go back and forth with those terms. Um, so don't be, uh, confused. Um, hook book look took was uh, introduced in the early 70s. Uh, it was meant to actually help Christian educators or Christian Bible educators uh, to teach the Bible across time, across geography, and across culture, right? Because all of us who have taught Sunday school uh, Bible study, like we know that, you know, there's sometimes we read a passage and we don't get it, right? Like, we're like, okay, like, there's a difference because we're not in the same time, we're not in the same culture, we're not in the same place. So, Hobo Kluk Tuk was created, was designed for that purpose. Um, and although it was meant for all age group, uh, you know, like I think David said, David C. Cook, uh, and that's sort of a misconception that Hobo Kluk Tuk was only meant for kids. Uh, but Hobo Kluk Tuk was actually created for all age group and actually for adults first. Uh, somehow, youth ministry got hold of it and kind of like really used it really well. And so everybody think about Hook Book Look Took, they think about David C. Cook uh, because they did use it really well. But, you know, in my mind, if you're, able to, if you're able to teach Sunday school to kids, then you're able to teach to all age group because there's nothing more difficult than teaching high school like Sunday school Bible study. If you're able to do it, then you can teach any single group because they're the hardest critic and they're the ones who are going to respond the fastest to your bad teaching. Like adults, we're still polite and we still have like, we're still civilized. But kids, I mean, if you're not a good teacher, they're going to let you know one way or the other. Um, so, uh, so that's why we're doing Hookbook Look Took. Uh, I'm not pretending that Hookbook Look Took is the only way to prepare a class, but it's one way that works well. It's one way that's been proven. And it's one way that, you know, uh, people still use today. Um, so that's why I'm using that. So it's not the kind of like the holy grail of of how to prepare a class, but it's one good way. Um, so let's look at the different parts uh, of the hook book look took. Uh, hook is basically, uh, and I'm at the first blank now, blank number one. Uh, hook is preparing the learner to hear God's word, right? That's what the, your hook is. Hook is creating a sense of anticipation, anticipation and excitement. And this is best achieved uh, when the teacher, the leader, uh, can connect their real world, so today's world, today's need, 
with the topic of the study, right? Remember, Hookbook Look Took was created to bridge culture, to bridge geography, to bridge, uh, you know, time. So how, as a teacher, do you hook your people? How do you kind of get their attention? Uh, and then lastly, you hope that you can guide the student to anticipate. So the word anticipation, anticipate is really important. How do you guide your student to anticipate blank number three? The teaching or the encouragement that is found in the lesson or the Bible study, right? Um, and that's sort of important. How, to, how, do you, how, how do you bring out that anticipation? So number two is anticipation. Number three is anticipate. And I just want to make it an emphasis. Uh, make people interested in it, right? Hook them. Uh, and that can take many shapes, you know? Uh, it could be an activity, it could be, uh, it could be a class interaction like we'll look at this afternoon. It could be, you know, it could just be a question. It just, it could be telling a story about the real world, the real need, and say, you know what? Well, that was like in the Bible times. Or start with the Bible story and say, you know what? This is no different than what is happening today in the news or whatever. So hook is like, how do you catch people's attention? How do you prepare them, right? Because um, we don't live, we live, we don't live in a, in a Christian world per se anymore. Like people don't have, this desire for God's word. People are not, don't know God's word. I mean, they don't see it as a valid truth to learn. So we need to kind of create that anticipation. Is that good? Stop me at any time uh, if you have questions. The second part is uh, the book. Uh, the book is more than just the book of the Bible. Uh, <laughs> although it's part of it, uh, the book is blank number four, reading the passage. And that's super important. I think sometimes like, it's like so easy to look over that and kind of say, okay, let's study. Look, so this is the passage, and this verse says this. Um, you know, that's not the best way to do it. I think reading is such a, especially when we come together to study the Word. Like, I mean, how many times in a week do you do this? Like, most probably once. The most two if you do it in Sunday school and then, and then Bible study, and then if you come to service. Uh, but we rarely do this. So reading the passage together, I think that's, uh, that's something that we have lost as a church, that we have lost as a community of, of Bible learners. Uh, oftentimes we'll say, okay, everybody reads on their own. I mean, there's, there's value to this because some people read slow, more slowly than the others. But I think reading together is something that has been lost. Uh, and I would encourage you as Bible study leaders, Sunday school teachers, to go back to it. Um, you know, because I think, I don't know, God gave us His Word so that it could be shared. Um, and that includes sharing with each other. Yeah. Uh, I think you just answered it, but I was going to ask, what did we lose? Yeah, I think, I think there's the sharing part. Sharing, like, you know, because it has become so individualized, right? Uh, like, it was, it was really neat when people would, would be able to share the Bible. Like, back in the days, right? Like, they didn't have unlimited amount of Bibles. And they were illiterate. And they were illiterate. So people got together, and, and there's something very natural that happens when people read together the Bible. I mean, people start asking questions. People start like, you know, it's a not, there's a natural flow of like wanting to learn God's Word, of wanting to immerse yourself in God's Word. Whereas today people read on their own, and then you don't really know if they're really reading it. And, you know, so I think there's, we're, we're losing that sense of fellowship of, the, of that kononia, kononia of the Word. Right, uh, this is one thing. Yeah. Back then they put more reading together, this one guy reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, but they, st they were still... Oh, yeah, As in, they were still public, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. Because, I mean, they weren't that, I mean, it took a, an entire lifetime for one monk to transcribe the whole Bible. Um, so you can imagine, like, and they were usually, like, kind of ordered, or, you know, rich people would say, oh, I, I'll pay you a lifetime of salary to write down a Bible for my family. Uh, and so, you know, if you were rich enough, then your family would have at least one, or one Bible, pretty much. Uh, and you would, you know, it was something that people would regularly do. Um, because they knew it was sacred, they knew that there was this need to get together to read it, right? So there was, yeah. So what's your take on, because I think our culture is so different now, because mm -hmm. we have a limited number of Bibles yeah. now, and everyone is literate, um, yeah. everyone can read it. Um, for me personally, I can't contemplate if we're reading it together or if someone's reading it to me. Okay. It takes a lot more effort for me to sit and listen rather than me just looking at the words. Mm -hmm. That's me personally, I don't know about everyone else, but yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of that, maybe because of our culture, it's changed it's like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's hard for me to understand what, what we lost. It's just mm -hmm. a culture thing for me. Yeah, I think, 
what we lost come, or I don't know if the culture comes first or what we lost came first, uh, but I think we've lost the art of reading. Like people read like drones. Like, I mean, anybody would kind of phase out if somebody read like reading the passage, unpack the passage to increase comprehension of the passage, understanding narrative, the context, the vocab, potential issues, controversy arising from the passage topic, yeah, right? Um, so I think we've lost. I mean, like the Bible, a lot of the Bible is written as narrative, as stories. Imagine if I read like stories to ex-boy like that. Like he would like, I mean, he's just a baby, but he would like get restless. He was like, what am I doing there sitting on your lap? And you're just like, you know, making noises. Um, so I think what we've lost is the art of reading because we haven't, I mean, you go to places like Africa, right? Uh, where storytelling is such a big part of their lives. Uh, because they know how to read. They, like, I mean, those who read, they know how to convey the message. Because whenever we read the Bible, it shouldn't just be words, right? But there's a whole, there's a whole baggage of, of emotion, there's a whole baggage of, uh, of intention, of motivation, of conflict, of whatever it is that inspire, or not inspired, but like surrounds those words, the context, right? Um, so I think we're, we, we all, we're all literate, but we might not necessarily know how to read, per se. Uh, we can we can see the words and we can make the sounds, but we don't convey the me the meaning behind it, right? Um, and so that's why I think in class, that's why so many people rather record classes or look at notes instead of going to the classroom because teachers are just themselves just really dronish, right? Um, so I think yeah, sorry. Uh, I just want to put in a few words. Yeah. Uh, when you mentioned about exploit, I remember when I was. Uh Playing in the church in uh, City West. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ruler yeah. and two or three. Right? She could not read. But whenever she saw me, she would come to the Uncle Phil. Can you read? read? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Cinderella, that's all my favorite <laughs> book. Right? So like, I started reading and she enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Right? And then she changed the story, the plot, and everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Even though she didn't know how to read yeah. anything. And I find that uh, we are losing the art of reading. You know, yeah. like, is I, I was here for the elementary school when I was here before. We always read aloud in class. Yeah. To make sure that, because some people say, well, I read it last night. Actually, they didn't. So the teacher makes sure that we go over it once together. Yeah. Then at least you have seen the whole thing at once, right? But then they also have another course called silent reading. Mm -hmm. right? So they have all the stories and you read it silently and you answer the question at yeah. the end. So. I think if all this together, we get a all around kind of education in a way. We because we are losing it. So uh, you are right. We should encourage the babies, the the kids to read more yeah. because they know. Hey, there's a whole bunch of treasure in the books, not only in the tablets and stuff like that. Right? They just don't play a game. They don't need to read much. Right? And they read all the instructions. Like they, Johnny. I mean. He used to read a lot of those instructions, and I say, ah, oh, so boring, right? But you don't get the stories, the fantasies, uh, yeah, yeah. and all those things anymore. I mean, that helped you to have your imagination going, and with the Bible, yeah. I mean, so rich totally. with the different stories. Yeah, like when I was teaching um, the high school group, what what we did really regularly, um, if we were if we were studying a passage that was uh, more narrative, more story like, then and the kids really liked it because they kept on asking to do it this way, uh, was that I would assign everybody a character and they would read the dialogue of that character um, and then somebody would be the narrator, right? So they kept on asking for that, so there must be some value in, mm -hmm. you know. And then if it, it wasn't a narrative, then a lot of times I would actually have the class take turns reading, but um, we would actually read it twice just so that for some people who, and I'm the same way, like it's hard for me to just read it once and then absorb everything. So if I do it again, um, it's a lot more, mm -hmm. uh, it goes in a lot better. Yeah, when, when you look at the Bible, I mean, there's different forms in the Bible, right? Different, lit, we call them lit, literary forms. Um, they were meant to be read differently. Like Psalm was dif was, is meant to read differently than let's say Chronicles. Uh, lamentation is meant to be read differently than, let's say, First Timothy, a letter to the church, where there's a lot of excitement and teaching the younger leaders. Where lamentation, you're just like, man, you're like, you want to die. That's basically how you should read this book. Um, so, like, so I think there's a lot of that, of that, that 
a lot of that that we have forgotten. Uh, and so we just read, we just read, like Uncle Phil said, like we lost the imagination. Uh, we've lost how to uh, read. We're just reading it as instructions. Uh, but that's not what it is. If, if the Bible is really a living word, and then our reading should come out just as lively, right? Uh, if, if we say that we're teaching the Bible so that life can be transformed, if as we read it together, we don't look like or we don't sound like we're being transformed by just reading it, then yeah, there's something missing. But I think, and so is it culture? Is it something that we lost for us? I don't know. But I think we definitely lost that, like the art of reading. Because uh, I mean, reality is that most probably in the church, God, if God gifts different people, then some people will have the gift of reading. But if we never read with them or if we never allow them to read to us or whatever it is, then we're never going to either learn or either get, you know, that, that side of, of the gospel or that side of the word. Um, so I think, it, yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I think there's, there is a place to read silently, but I think it has taken so much more weight over reading together, um, which is, yeah, unfortunate. Uh, so I encourage you guys to go back to just reading the passage. Um, I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, we read a passage, and, and, I, and I understand, right? Like sometimes it's, it's discouraging because either you don't get it or sometimes you read it together and say, okay, you ask a question and people don't answer and you're like, how come they don't get it? Like we just read it. Uh, but, you know, but that's the thing. We just, we just went over it, but we didn't actually immerse ourselves in it, like use our imagination or the reading was just kind of like, oh, right? So does this mean we need to spend more time <coughs> on a Bible study or Sunday school lesson <coughs> focusing on, on reading? Uh, I wouldn't say, I think right now because we don't do it, as much, yes, uh, but it shouldn't just be the focus of it, right? Because uh, the reasons why we're together is so that we can actually learn, like unpack it, and, and that's actually the next thing, like the, the blank number five is unpack, right? Unpacking the passage. Uh, but unpacking the passage, I think, should not happen without reading it. And so if we don't do it, then yeah, we should definitely do more of it. Um, there's some of you guys that, I mean, I know in your Sunday school class, you'll do it, but I think tendency more and more in churches, I find, is that less and less, is it happening, you know? Uh, the whole idea of scripture reading during service, that's, a lot of churches are losing that because they just pop it up on the screen, right? And they just expect pe people to read it. I mean, it's good, technology is good, but I think there are some, there are some things about scripture reading that is super holy. I mean, like you have a whole congregation silent in front of one person reading the entire text for, for the whole group. I mean, that's a pretty darn holy thing, you know? Um, so, yeah. So I think we should do it more if we have to. So sorry, just one more thing. Um, mm -hmm. So going back to reading again, so does that mean that we should put a little bit more emphasis in, let's say, having people have their own Bible or opening yeah. up to that passage? Because what yeah. I find in classes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we'll study Colossians, whatever. Yeah. And, you know, some people are just like, right. I'm going to wait for somebody to read it and I won't yeah. you know, bother opening the Bible. Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely think that everybody, sh I mean, it's a luxury that we have and we're not, you know, taking advantage of it. Um, we should, yeah, I would definitely, I, I still encourage people to bring their own Bibles. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, even if it's on the phone or whatever, at least you have it, right? I mean, like, use it, read it. If you have it available, then why don't you open it, you know? Um, yeah. So, thanks guys for great, 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 great questions. Unpacking, I don't know if that answers your question. Tim, sorry, okay. Uh, so unpack the passage, blank number five. Uh, unpacking means, or is meant to increase the comprehension of the passage, right? So sometimes, yeah, we will read it together. Some people will, will not get it, either because they're new Christians or they're non-Christians, or they just didn't get it, or it's hard to understand. So unpacking it means understanding the narrative, understanding the context. The narrative means a story. Understanding the context, understanding the vocabulary. Like sometimes there's some words that, yeah, like total Christian jargon, right? Uh, so how do you unpack that? How do you explain that? Uh, explain potential issues. Uh, explain potential controversies. There's a lot of passage that, you know, will bring a lot of controversy. Like, why did uh, so-and-so go kill the entire family that raped my sister? Or why, you know, uh, or why, um, I don't know, why did God, uh, you know, destroy an entire nation? You know, those are controversies, those are potential issues that people might have. Uh, and they might be sometimes tangents, but sometimes those tangents will help the listener or the student to actually understand the package. 
So sometimes, you know, it's good to unpack these things. Uh, it means more maybe research from the study leader or the, the Bible study uh, or the Sunday school teacher, but I think uh, it's worth the while sometimes. Um, another thing uh, that you do for as a teacher to unpack uh, is that, you know, obviously, like, we are very unlearned, uh, myself included, and we need to rely on other people's research. Uh, we need to rely on other people's commentaries, uh, up-to-date books. Um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. Um, word of caution, though, beware of internet sources. It's so easy to just go on Google and type what, blah, 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 or like name of the book. There's a lot of resources. I, I mean, like, it's just overwhelming. But just be careful what you use. Uh, well, actually, I'll, if you look at the back of page, if you look at page three, I think, there's an appendix. And those are reliable sources that I would, uh, if you want to use the internet, that I will recommend. Because uh, there's a lot of garbage out there, like a lot of garbage. Uh, I try to avoid blogs usually, because blogs are usually one guy writing what he wants and there's no peer review. Uh, but peer review is not also uh, the only validation. So Wikipedia is, yeah, just, yeah, Wikipedia, don't, don't use it. Um, it's just a lot of garbage there. Uh, and if you, if you are to use it, if you are to use Wikipedia, at least go to the, to the references and the bibliography and look at what they use. If they, I mean, if the guy talks about Jesus Christ and like the reference is Jesus Christ is my buddy, I mean like, okay, something's, I mean, okay, um, you know, something's wrong. Um, so just be careful of that. Um, some, I will just go through the appendix A, um, page three. Uh, some good websites are not necessarily commentaries or anything, but just good resources because many people write into those. Uh, the resurgence, so if you know Tim Keller, if you know Mark Driscoll, uh, they have a whole group of people uh, that will post stuff for free. Um, another one that's really, really cool that I've, I've been using for maybe two years now, it's called the uh, Veritas Forum, so veritas.org. And that's a very academic uh, website for Christian. Uh, it's like a YouTube for Christian geeks. Um, but they also only invite Christian geeks to post. Um, so not only like do the people who use it are geeks, but the people who are also speaking from it are super geeks. Um, so I mean, so that's really, really good. Uh, tons of resources there. Uh, the Gospel Coalition is another one. Um, if you know Matt Chandler, if you know like these guys, uh, guys who are really, really focused on the gospel and really focused on, on preaching it right, uh, go there. Um, there's also a website or fan pages or reliable fan pages about modern theologians. Uh, N.T. Wright, uh, Himself, a lot of people would say he's controversial, uh, but he's just a, just a good thinker. Um, and so you can go with him. Uh, John Piper, Desiring God, um, a lot of good stuff there. Uh, he's actually, side note, he's actually uh, quitting his church so that he can be, he ma he's making it himself available to serve other churches. Uh, so I think the content of his website might slightly change as well to serve the greater church, which is really encouraging for us because uh, we can't invite him here. He's retiring, but he's making himself, so he's doing what uh, Rob Bell is doing. So Rob Bell quit his church, and he's actually making himself available for teaching in churches, conferences. Huh? I said Rob Bell's a heretic. Well, he's a different kind of Christian. Um, yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so I mean, so that's what John Piper is doing. So he's retiring, but he's still being active for the ministry, uh, which is really, really neat. And he's such a good teacher. Um, uh, good commentaries. Some of them we actually have in our library, but it, they're like collecting dust, so please use them. Um, uh, we have like uh, NIV Bible studies. I mean, for uh, NIV study Bible, sorry. Like for Bible studies, th those are perfect because there's just the right amount of information, just the right information you want, not too much like overwhelming like commentaries. Uh, so those are great. Uh, we have another commentary called the uh, Word Biblical Commentary. It's like the ugly blue one with lines and you're like, this is so retro. Uh, and they are retro, but they're really good. Uh, so, and we have one for almost every single book of the Bible. Uh, so when you have questions, like, instead of Wikipedia, just go to it. I mean, this is so much better, so much more reliable. Um, uh, another one that I use on my, on my computer uh, that sometimes I copy-paste for you guys, which is uh, a bit more technical stuff, but the Hermonia commentary, uh, they're not finished writing it because they have so much stuff to write in, so it's still in progress. Uh, they haven't been able to comment all of the Bible yet. Uh, but very, very exciting stuff. Um, another one that's really, really exciting, I just started reading this month, 
are getting used to is the reform expository expository commentary. That was another one that's really like I mean if you the good thing about the reform people like they got a lot of things right in terms of theology and doctrines uh, and they're hard to beat in terms of understanding. Um, so the reform expo expo expositor expository commentary they're just really really good at that. Uh, we don't have it here yet but I'm definitely going to purchase some volumes for it uh, for our library. Uh, a word of caution when you go to Bible Gateway and they say, oh, use our commentary. Uh, they use Matthew Henry, was, which was written like, I don't know, like, I think it was written like during King James Version, which means it was written before the greatest discovery of the 20th century of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dead Sea Scrolls changed every, not everything, changed a lot of things in terms of our Christian understanding because they were such reliable, close to the original text. King James Version didn't have that. Matthew Henry didn't have that. So a lot of, that, a lot of the stuff that they're going to write is either going to be not as precise or maybe sometimes totally off. Uh, so, just, uh, so just be careful or just be cautious when you use those free online commentaries because if they're free, it's because they've, they're pretty old. <laughs> uh, that's why they can't be free, right? Uh, so use wisely. And Wikipedia, yeah, just stay away from it because um, it's definitely not reliable. Cool. Any questions? If I'm going too fast, you have to let me know. Sometimes if I know absolutely nothing about a subject, yeah. I go to the Wikipedia to get a general overview, and then I will go deeper in. OK, so just to get, OK, I see what you mean. OK. I think that's using it wisely, because you're like, don't base your teaching on Wikipedia. So at the limit, like, OK, that's acceptable. I mean, a lot of people do that, right? Like, just because they want to know about it or hear something about it. But, uh, but yeah, if you do, then continue what you're doing, like go deeper by using other. Yeah, look at the bibliography at the bottom uh, and follow those links. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, that is okay, right? That's using it wisely. Like you're not kind of putting all your eggs in one basket, which is Wikipedia, which is, like, yeah, dangerous, very dangerous. Um, yeah. Who here has used Wikipedia in the past? I think we all have, right? For Bible studies. Yeah, yeah I don't use my Bible studies, but like, like for like history. history. Yeah, for like history. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, most history. Yeah, but see, because you're teaching church history, so just be careful about it. Oh, no, I use, I use your book for that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's always good to have, like, Wikipedia is nice if you already have a solid reference, right? Uh, or if you want to look for other references, um, if the references at the bottom are reliable. Otherwise, yeah, be careful. Cool. Any other questions? So the book is really just the reading, the understanding of the passage, right? So we haven't gone deeply into it yet. We haven't gone to application yet. Uh, we just want to understand the text, right? So this is sort of what people will, the technical word would be like exegeting your, pas your passage. So kind of like looking at what the passage is and kind of getting all the information and understanding how it works as a whole, right? Um, once you did the book part, uh, you go to the look. Uh, Tim talked about application, right? Uh, application in the hook book look took is look is application and the took as well is application. There's two levels of application. So for the look, uh, the blank number six is blank number six, uh, leading the class to draw basic or general application. Right? Yeah, write small. Um, <laughs> Leading the class to draw basic or general application. Uh, important questions for your preparation, right? For your preparation would be, uh, what does this passage means? What does this, what does, what did the passage mean to the original reader? What does the passage mean to the church, the collective church, the Christian community, society today, right? Um, those are questions that uh, you ask yourself as a teacher. Don't ask that question to your students um, because that's not fair because you're supposed to be thinking about that before uh, you lead them into application. Uh, appli and then so once you think, when, once you thought about it, then think about application questions. Application questions should, I mean in the past we always said, okay, how do, how do you apply today's lesson? Or, you know, what does this mean to us today? Uh, people in the 21st century are really smart. Don't ask them easy questions like this. When people don't answer usually it's because their questions are really not challenging. They're like, Ugh. or because they can't think about it because it's so general, so broad. 
right? Uh, so quest application, application questions like what do you, how do you apply and, and what does it mean, uh, avoid those. Uh, it might have worked like in the 80s and the 70s, uh, but not anymore. Uh, people are learned, people are smart, people want to be challenged, people want to grow. If people come to Sunday school, people come to, sun to Bible studies because they want to be challenged. Uh, most of them. Some people will be forced. Uh, but hopefully, by having challenging questions, that will kind of ignite a desire to be in class to learn stuff. Um, so, and it's not to say that those two questions, right, how do you apply and, and what does it mean are bad questions. They're actually really good questions. But I think because of the context of today's world, those are questions that you yourself as teachers should ask yourself as you prepare. What does it mean to the congregation? What does it mean to us? How do you apply it? That's a question that you will ask yourself for your own preparation, right? Uh, and hopefully by, by reflecting on those questions yourself, then you'll be able to, to dig up or dig out more specific application questions or more, uh, or more relatable application questions, right? Uh, I'm more, I don't know, thought-provoking, more challenging, whatever you want to call it, but just more learned question, put it that way. And again, look is, again, right, general, basic applications. So usually in the Sunday school, in the Bible study, that's like one or, two, one, or, one or two questions, depending. If it's a Sunday school, I would say maybe one or two, because Sunday school is supposed to be traditionally more technical or more doctrine-oriented, less personal but more collective. If, it's a, if, you, if you teach a Bible study, then that's meant to be more personal, so I would say maybe only one question of look. But then two question of took. Took meaning, uh, what do students take away, right? What do they take away to apply in their daily lives? So that's the really specific applications. Yeah. Going back to um, the application questions uh, yeah. that we shouldn't really ask, but we should ask ourselves. Or yeah. Like so instead of asking, how does this apply today? Yeah. What would be an example of what? It, it's going to depend. That's what I'm saying. It's going to depend on each passage. Because I think we used to use those two questions as cash questions for any passages. Yeah. And that's a very unlearned way to do application nowadays. Um, so I can't tell you what kind of question they're going to be. All I can tell you is that they're going to be more specific, more thought-provoking, more challenging, more learned. That's all I can tell you. Because um, I think today's world is so complex that there's no one-fit-all application question, even when it comes to general application. Um, so, yeah. That's the best answer I can give, or the best encouragement. Um, so for the took part, the took part is going to be more specific application to each person's daily life, right? And so there, in, the, in this took part, you're hoping to lead the class or lead each person to integrate or personalize blank number six, uh, personal life or applications. Oh, actually, yeah. Personal life. Personal life, uh, sorry. Personal life changing application. Blank number six. Personal, personal life changing applications. And then blank number seven. And make a concrete decision. Personal life changing application. And make a concrete decision. And that's something that's hard. But if we are educators of the Bible, and it is a living word, and it is meant to change lives, then it will happen, right? So leading the class, hoping each student, and focus on the each student, right? Because that's the took part. You want every single student to take something away, to apply in their daily lives, so that their lives are changed, and so that they can make concrete decisions. And the concrete decision is going to be tough, um, because there's only so much you can do as a teacher. Uh, but I think if you are able to present or teach the word in a compelling way, there's no reason why the Holy Spirit wouldn't be able to convict people. Uh, that's the job of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's His job, but I think as educators, we have our part to do. Uh, and, you know, yes, we have our own weaknesses, but, you know, let's not, let's not let our weaknesses be bigger than they need to, right? I mean... We are learned people, we are able to prepare well, we are able to think well. Uh, let's do it to, to the fullest. So that it's 100% our effort and 100% the Holy Spirit convicting people, right? 
Um, I'd go as far to say that without a took, uh, you basically have no lesson. Without a took, you have no Sunday school class, so might as well not do anything because people can just read on their own, right? Or people can just whatever. Uh, so you need people to actually leave with something, take away something. Um, you know, the blank number eight is that the teacher, the leader does not communicate the purpose of the word. And the purpose of the word is to change lives, right? So if there's no took, there's no lives changed, there's no lesson. Uh, it's that simple. Right? So those are the four parts uh, of the hook book look took. So like I said, like a, a slight adjustment from what Tim said uh, in the book part and the application part. Um, because the word of God is so important, then application needs to take two levels, the look and the took. Right? Any questions? The um, concrete decision again? Yeah. So typically, let's say if you teach a class on the importance of God's word, and then you say, okay, so what's your took, guys? It's like, I should read the Bible more. All right. So that's your look. I mean, everybody has to do it, not only you. Uh, the took part would be in your life, in your own personal life. What is not going right? Or what are you missing? Why are you not doing it? Right? Each person, I think, has their own reasons. Uh, but they need to be aware of it and say, you know what, yeah, this is messed up. How come I can't read the Bible because of so and so, because of this and that in my life? And make a decision to say, you know what, I'm going to fix this. So that's the concrete decision to realize that, yeah, I need... Because if the, the Word of God is to change lives, which means there's something wrong with us. So they need to realize there's something wrong in them and make a decision to change that. Right? If they leave the class saying, oh, I learned a lot of stuff, but they didn't change their lives, then we all miss the point. So that concrete decision is realizing that and saying, okay, I will make a change. I, there's a need, there's a lack, or whatever it is, uh, and being able to identify what that problem is. Do we need to follow up on that decision? Yeah. Um, it, yeah, that's, I think, it's something that we sh should have to do normally, just like naturally as a community of God. Like, I mean, otherwise, what's the point of getting together, right? Like the whole idea that of a community that you share, but in the sharing, there's also the shared responsibility and accountability to each other, right? Uh, so when we see in the church that people don't even call each other when they don't see each other like on a Sunday or something, like I mean, that, there's a huge problem in, in the Christian world right now because we're so individualized. I mean, we come to church all together, but we do our own stuff together, um, which is sort of like very, very sad. Um, so I think, yes, we have to, but that's not only the teacher, that's everybody. I mean, that's even the peer, and the, the peer your, your, your friends in the, in the class. Right? I mean, you guys are all, we're all learning together. Uh, if you're learning well, then you should be accountable, responsible enough to share with, with your brother and your sister. Say, you know what, like, this is what happened this past week when I learned this. How about you? And I think just with having those natural conversations, if that per other person didn't do it, then you'll know right away. So there's no, I mean, like there's a fine line between mechanically or like just uh, fabricating that accountability, and, but there's such a good way to do it naturally. But we just don't humble ourselves and don't make ourselves available to that. Uh, I mean, it doesn't take much to say, hey, how are you? And instead of saying, I don't know, how's work? Or, you know, how's the family? You say, what did you learn this past week? Or were you able to do this? I mean, we see each other every week. I mean, uh, you know, like there's not much, or there's not much, there, I guess there is a lot that could change in a week in, in your home, in your work. But I, I don't think it would hurt to ask, okay, how did you go spiritually? Because we don't ask that question that often, you know? Um, yes, it's an uncomfortable question, but I think it's uncomfortable because we've just forgotten how to do it, right? Um, so, like I remember my cohort when I was here, when I was younger, like the, the Huber, the Tsewen, the Moto, the, like, like it was so natural for us to just go up and say like, how are you doing, like, you know? And like, but how are you doing like spiritually, like meaning like, you know, how you, how, what are you struggling with or, you know, how is your discipleship going? Um, so I think, you know, I, and I think even my cohort, we were already losing it. So I think it's been something that's been happening for a while. Um, but I mean, but it's something that we're losing more and more. Um, so yes, as a teacher, you have to do it, but it's not only you, right? Um, I mean, we are Baptist. Um, as Baptists, we believe, one of the biggest things that we believe in is the priesthood of all believers. 
a priesthood of all believers. That means a lot. Priesthood meaning that we're a community of, of teacher learners. All of us. It's not just that Sunday school teachers. But if you're a student, you're a priest as well. And we're all together doing this. This idea of discipleship is, is at our core. Uh, not that you know Pentecostals don't have that in anything, but like for if we call ourselves Baptists and we hold to that, then it's, it's pretty important, you know. Um, so, yeah. But that's a really good question, because yes, as a teacher, you have the call to explain and educate, uh, but it doesn't only fall on you, you know. Anybody wants to add to that question or echo? Like, how do you guys do it? Like, do you guys follow up on the people? As a teacher or as a non-teacher? Right? Sometimes I follow up. You know, how is, like, let's say we talked about grace yeah. you know, last week. So mm-hmm. how was your week? Did you experience, you know, grace? And, right. you know, did you pass that on? And, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. kind of, people kind of forget right after they walk out of this church. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 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 most churches, right? I mean, it's just, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I think it's a, it's a valid question if we ask that same question for any Christians, you know? Um, yeah. Cool. So how do, you, how do you start using Hookbook Look Took? How do you practice it? Um, it's a nice way to prepare a class, but I think it does not happen until blank number nine, until you pray before you start, right? Praying is more, more than just an element or more than just a, a checklist that you need to do in your Sunday school, in your Bible study. Uh, it's part of your preparation. If you have good prayer time in your preparation, you'll have amazing prayer time in your Sunday school uh, because you need to be prepared yourself as a teacher, which means not only the material, but spiritually as well. You, know? you need to be in tune with God. And one of the ways to do it is prayer, definitely prayer. Uh, I would say after that, like the way, and this is not like a, a bulletproof thing, okay? This is not a formula. This is just, uh, the rest is kind of how I did it. Uh, I just mechanically went through the four steps. I thought, okay, these are the four steps. They're pretty simple. I'm going to apply every single one of them in high prepare class. Every single one of them. I'm just going to do it like a machine. Boom, boom, boom. Make sure, I almost have a checklist. Do I have this? Do I anticipate? Do I create, you know, do I create excitement? You know, are people... Are we spending enough time reading the Bible? Are we spending enough time unpacking it? Are we doing enough to unpack it? Are we drawing general, general applications? And then are we doing specific application? Are people able to leave with something? Like I just did it as a checklist, like very, very mechanical. And eventually, eventually, once you're really comfortable with those four steps, once you know how they work, once you know how they, the dynamic works between the four steps, then it might become like, I don't know, it might become a book hook, took look. I don't know, like it might, you just start, moving it around, right? Sometimes you'll be able to like mash up two steps together, but still keep them, still keep the task intact, right? Um, and so that's why I'm saying like, it's one way to do it. It's not the only way, but it's a pretty good way to start. Uh, you know, cause if you're able to do those four steps or those, achieve those four objective of hookbook look took, you're gonna have a pretty solid lesson. Really, really solid, right? Um, hey, so, uh, so yeah, so make sure that every step is included, right? Make sure that every step is included. Um, now looking, now, now that we've looked at the hookbook, look, one of the questions I could have asked you guys to make, kind of like set up you for, set you up for failure is uh, ask you, how do you usually prepare a class? What do you include in a class? <coughs> like, do you, would you be able to look back and say honestly, okay, yeah, I did, I, I had all those four elements. Most probably not, right? Some people do, but but usually we spend a lot of time on the book and the look. Or we spend a lot of time on the book itself and that's it. But there's no hook. There's no preparation. People are not excited for it. People are not anticipating learning. And people learn a lot about it, but there's no application. And if there's an application, it's super general. Right? So I think the four steps are pretty important. Um, it's hard to do the took without the look, right? Because application is such a big part of it. Uh, you might be, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's some passages that are maybe more easy to just have a took and no look or to mash up the two. 
but usually you need to kind of build up that understanding because it's going to be hard for a learner to be able to apply God's word in their own personal lives without knowing what it meant to the people back then. Right? We're just, I mean, if we're looking at the Bible and, and we know it's across time, we know it's across culture and geography, we need to make sure that we teach the right thing. And part of teaching the right thing is understanding what it meant to the people back then, what it means to the church now, and then what it means to us now. Because if we just do only took, then we're going to end up with people with a very subjective truth, right? Like, well, what, is, what works for me is what it works for me, right? Like, if it's my application, then it's going to be true. And if yours is really different but totally off, then that's okay because that's yours, right? That's rel relativity. But we don't want that. We want to make sure that whatever truth people are leaving with is going to be a truth that, yes, has been uh, supported by God or the truth of God that worked back then to the church and to the individuals. So there's three levels to that understanding application. So look and took, they need to be there.